I want to talk about the Commonwealth of England, this new form of government, and talk about the early stages of that. The Commonwealth does go on uh, for uh, quite a while. So there's a lot of details to cover here. It is a new form of government for England. And again, something that looks more like uh, what we consider our form of government, you know, our democratic form of government, uh, and really is the groundwork for um, the way that our constitution, uh, our written constitution, uh, was formulated uh, in the United States. So Charles is beheaded for treason against Parliament, even though he's the monarch, and treason is traditionally treason against the monarchy. Okay, so this is a real ideological twist. Um, we have Charles who's supported by Scotland, uh, but the Commonwealth forms independently with no king. And uh, now in the Netherlands, they did have something similar where they had uh, what was called a stadtholder, which is was the executive of uh, like the union of seven uh, Netherlands states. Uh, and, and so that has a lot of features in common with this. Uh, but then that role of stadtholder was usually given to someone of noble birth. What happens in the Commonwealth is that the executive position actually ends up going to a military leader who is uh, not a military. That's a novelty that hadn't quite appeared before this. And so we have the Netherlands that is developing the idea of a republic, and now the Commonwealth is, is a in in the full uh, <clears throat> you know, traditional sense of that where there is no monarch. And the executive is um, largely controlled by parliament. The executive still has certain prerogatives, uh, but nothing along the lines of a monarch. <clears throat> Just like the president is, is, has traditionally in the United States been controlled by Congress and the judiciary by the Congress and the Supreme Court. Uh, but of course, we've seen over the last decades long, you know, um, since before I was born, we've seen the power of the presidency being expanded to overshadow uh, other branches of government. But up until about the 19, uh, uh, well, until FDR, um, Parliament and the judiciary had a lot more control over the president. <clears throat> uh, and, and so this is where, you know, a lot of these um, notions of Republican gover governance uh, come from is from the experience of the English uh, Commonwealth. Now the Commonwealth is initially ruled by the Rump Parliament. So they just continue to uh, function as the supreme, uh, you know, supreme governance uh, branch, you know, uh, of the land, and just rule by parliamentary procedure. Uh, they pass an act abolishing the monarchy. They abolish the House of Lords. Um, there is no House of Lords. You know that was taken care of in the Pride's um, uh, Pride's push. Uh, and um, uh, but they make it a law, you know, they put it in a law that there's no more House of Lords. So just being of noble birth doesn't give you a right to be in Parliament. Is that that's what the House of Lords is all about? If you have a noble title, you can show up to the House of Lords. Um, <clears throat> So they pass an act declaring the constitution and the people of England to be a commonwealth and a free state. Okay, so this is really important. 
they call themselves a commonwealth is another name for a republic and a free state. So this is a fully self-conscious nation state for the first time in England. The, the parliament as the House of Commons, not as nobility, are becoming fully conscious of themselves as a, a, a nation unto themselves, independent of any nobility and any monarchy. Now the lowest stratum of society has taken over through the help of the first standing army. That was a word to the wise. Um, <clears throat> so they passed the Treasons Act uh, and they just find uh, treason as disloyalty to the House of Commons. You know, and, and so now the House of Commons has officially in law uh, being itself the person to uh, against which treason can be enacted. Um, in in the House of Commons, there are two controlling factions. We have lawyers uh, uh, opposing the leveler proposals uh, for reform. Uh, a lot of the proposals of the levelers are to reform the legal system so that it's more understandable, so that you don't need as much assistance from lawyers and it's not so expensive uh, because even if even if uh, nobility is not their high interest, you still have wealthy people who can manipulate the legal system and the common soldiers who are from you know who are not wealthy uh, are concerned about uh, having the legal system used against them and just having the experience of of it being too expensive to sue somebody uh, which of course we still have issues with that today so you have that faction of lawyers uh, so they're tied into the traditional legal system because that's where their expertise is and then the other faction is the city of london capitalists okay and the city of london here is not just london uh, when when uh, when we say city of London, it's like Wall Street, um, which when we say Wall Street, we don't mean that street in lower Manhattan. We mean the institution of Wall Street. We mean the stock market, the bankers, all the finance and people that aren't, don't even set foot on Wall Street, right? Um, the city of London is similar, um, but the city of London is a neighborhood within London that um, is where all the finance and banking and everything goes on in England. So it's like their equivalent of Wall Street. So you have city of London, you have lawyers, okay. Um, they raise a lot of revenue by selling crown lands like these forests and things like that and selling off church property, okay. Um, but this is purely financial transactions and uh, so here you have uh, a total abandonment of, of the feudal sort of structure. We have a revision of the agreement of the people. Okay, so this is just another sort of revised uh, agreement. These are often uh, anonymous sort of pamphlets put out, but, but uh, the levelers from the new model army are still trying to get their proposals for new laws uh, in on the books. You have a, a, a rebellion of people called diggers. Um, this is 1649 to 1652, a little bit of a longer uh, occupation of enclosures, a little bit more successful. And these people actually set up uh, communes where they live in common, they, they build housing structures, uh, sleep in dormitories, or maybe uh, have clusters of buildings. They have uh, common um, mess halls, you know, and they're sort of trying to enact something along the lines of Moore's utopia. Um, and they're called diggers because they're not just leveling the hedges around enclosures, they're actually uh, they're actually plowing the fields and digging the dirt and farming them and successfully farming them over uh, at least a couple of seasons. 
<clears throat> so the diggers, that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and we'll see this come up later that uh, this is really one of the first uh, successful sort of experiments in communal living that then becomes a movement in the 19th century of utopian socialists. Okay, uh, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, we have the Bishopsgate leveler mutiny. Uh, and then in the wake of that, we have an agreement of the people um, that is more widely published and it's the fullest sort of statement of the leveler position. The authors identify themselves as levelers. So now they've, what was first an epithet, uh, they've now adopted it as their name, which often happens with political groups. And um, so they want suffrage. And so here's where I lay out, you know, a list of their demands. They want suffrage for all male adult non-wage earners. Uh, and they want non-wage earners because they want to avoid corruption of the vote. You know, if you're working, uh, from for some burger as an apprentice or a, a journeyman, you might be pressured to vote the way your master craftsman uh, wants you to vote. Or if you're a servant in a large household, the lord of the manor, you know, may be telling you, okay, you're going to cast your vote this way. So they're concerned about <clears throat> corruption of the vote in that way. So they want non-wage earners. They want uh, biennial elections, so every two years. Uh, parliament will be dissolved and then there would be elections again. Uh, they want religious freedom for separatists, Puritans, um, and, uh, and that's mainly their concern is on Puritan grounds. And they want uh, an end to imprisonment for debt. So people who go into debt at this time can be imprisoned and then there's no way to pay off your debt. Uh, and this is how we get a lot of indentured servants uh, come to the colonies in North America. A lot of the early colonists uh, that came to the colonies in the, North America were, were actually indentured servants who owed so many years of servitude to pay off their debt that they had accumulated. Um, they want an elimination of parliamentary corruption. They're concerned about judicial corruption. And they wanted the law translated into English. Of course, as a holdover from the Roman times, all legal proceedings were held, uh, or all legal documents were written in Latin. And so, uh, you know, that was part of the power of lawyers. And of course, this is a big faction within parliament is that they knew Latin and could understand the law just at that basic level. Uh, this is part of what establishes their power is they, they are the only ones who can read the law. Uh, so the levelers want the law written in English. Seems like a reasonable, uh, a reasonable request. At this time, there's a young Prince William of Orange uh, born, and uh, his father had died actually uh, sometime right before he was born. Um, he's born in the Netherlands in the in the uh, Duchy of Orange, and he becomes the Prince of Orange upon birth. And he's the grandson of of Charles the First. Uh, of England uh, by a marriage, uh, you know, uh, the way these marriages go across onto the continent and the nephew of Charles II uh, of England. And um, and so this William now is, you know, part of the extended family of, of the uh, royal line. He will come up later. That's why I'm mentioning him. And he's this Prince of Orange in the Netherlands. So he, he's the real connection to the Netherlands here, as we'll see unfold. Uh, Cromwell, uh, Cromwell's Scottish campaign. So uh, 
1650 to 1651, there's a campaign of the new model army to oust Charles II from Scotland. And Oliver Cromwell is the commander of this expedition. Um, he puts, the, he successfully puts Scotland under military occupation. He ends the reign of Charles II and Charles flees into exile in the Spanish Netherlands. So William of Orange is in the, the, uh, the republics, uh, the Republic of the seven provinces in the Northern part of the Netherlands. Uh, Charles is in exile in the Southern part of the Netherlands, which is the Spanish controlled portion of the Netherlands, as I discussed uh, earlier. Uh, now, a big turning point here for us, which is maybe not emphasized in other treatments uh, of this history, is that trade and colonialism is redefined along capitalist lines. So Parliament sets up a commission of trade for the first time, so that there's an there's a, 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 a administrative body that, that regulates domestic and foreign trade. That's, that's their ongoing concern is to regulate those and to look for abuses and bring that to the attention of parliament so they can make corrections in the law or um, conduct prosecutions or whatever the case may be. Um, and what they focus on is the regulation of the colonies for the financial welfare of the Commonwealth. Um, their main objective is to make the colonies bring revenue into the Commonwealth of England so that the colonies are financially supporting um, the Commonwealth. And that's a very you know, capitalistic way of looking at colonialization. Of course, we already have the East India Company uh, operating, but now this becomes government policy to operate more along the lines of the East India Company. And to, uh, it, rather than thinking of colonies as like a, an expansion of territory and therefore an expansion of, of grandeur through the acquiring of territory, as I mentioned before, territory can be difficult to maintain, um, you know, because then you have to protect it with armies and things like, and that costs money. Um, but if the colonies are actually if you're actually extracting wealth from the colonies back into the homeland, then all the trouble of maintaining the colonies makes sense. A very different way of looking at things from the way like the, the Spanish empire approached it. You know, They weren't concerned primarily with making the colonies profitable, but it just so happened that there was a lot of gold and silver in, in the American, uh, colonies that they established, so that worked out pretty good. <clears throat> they passed the, an act prohibiting trade with the Barbados, Virginia, uh, Bermuda, and Antigua. These are all royalist colonies that are still loyal to, um, to Charles II, okay? And, um, and then an act to increase shipping and encourage navigation. So they're really trying to uh, subsidize the shipping industry to compete with the Dutch shipping industry. So as I mentioned before, the Netherlands had a, a strong uh, shipping infrastructure that was going all over the world. And um, I, don't, I think something that I didn't mention was that um, the, the Dutch were, unique in that they started uh, they started manufacturing large ships that were purely for transport of cargo. They didn't have any cannon um, and they were made to go as fast as possible with the largest amount of cargo, uh, but they were relatively unprotected. So they were purely uh, merchant vessels. That was very unique. Up until that point, all vessels were, were military vessels. And they started producing 
merchant vessels. So here we have England trying to get on in on the act on that and thinking in capitalistic terms and thinking in terms of the city of London. Okay, how can we make the government work for the city of London? Okay. Um, Cromwell, after his uh, Scottish expedition, uh, successful there, comes back to Parliament. He, he was, uh, he is a member of, of the House of Commons, and so he comes back and um, begins to get active again in Parliament. Um, about this time, we have the first Anglo-Dutch War, so now England is going to war against the Netherlands. It's fought entirely at sea. There's no land battles. And it's all about this commercial colonial rivalry, trying to control shipping routes in order to control the transport of goods around the world uh, from the perspective of England in order to support the interest of the city of London against the stock exchange in Amsterdam. Um, and a phenomenon that arises around this time and then, uh, and then just becomes a, a, a consistent feature of, of warfare and even outside of warfare is that there's a lot of privateering going on where <clears throat> um, certain captains of military style vessels are given authorization to hunt down capture and uh, steal the goods or whatever of enemy ships. And, um, and so this starts out first as something sanctioned by the government against certain enemies. But once you start, once people get trained as privateers, uh, they, they soon in the coming decades become pirates. And so the golden age of the pirates is coming up and it's, and it's uh, largely an outgrowth of this, this practice of privateering, which becomes uh, prevalent, um, especially in the first Anglo-Dutch war. Uh, there was privateering going on in the time of Elizabeth as well. But um, in the coming decades after the first Anglo-Dutch war, um, pirates, as we think of pirates, like pirates of the Caribbean, that's that they they evolve out of this privateering business around this time. And so Cromwell, uh, he's getting impatient with the lack of uh, um, progress on the question of a new constitution in Parliament, and he. Uh, using armed troops uh, dissolves parliament. He kicks everybody out of chambers and, and he just declares, he has a, no authority to do this. Uh, he's just a member of parliament, uh, but using his uh, command of the military and his recent success in Scotland, uh, unseating Charles II, uh, using that, um, uh, you know, sort of charismatic mandate, he dissolves parliament and, um, and then elects his own parliament called the bare bones parliament. And he and the council of officers, that's the high ranking grandees within the new model army um, who form a, a sort of political unit, a very small group of people, um, elect a bare bones parliament of people that they like, you know, that they can uh, expect to do what they want them to do. And the bare bones parliament is tasked to find a new, uh, found a new constitution. And within six months, they can't agree. And so they dissolve themselves. Okay, no constitution. Uh, the next phase then is to move into the protectorate and um, uh, here we have now a new sort of inflection of the Commonwealth. And so I wanna separate this off as a, as a separate recording. So I'll stop this one here and I'll, I'll pick up there with the next recording. <laughs>